Hello to everyone. Welcome. A good morning. Good mid afternoon. A good evening. I welcome you to my podcast and life in Christ. Lessons from our Lord's miracles and parables. This is your pastor, Yati. I welcome you in to hear how Jesus worked through his parables and miracles, touched other people, and for us in the 21st century, how does, after more than 2,000 years, fit this in your life? as a present moment, as God is ever present in our lives, to walk with Him, to see things happen. Today I'm going to talk about Jesus reject. And all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust Him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill upon where their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went away. Luke 4, 28 to 30. Jesus had spent several years in the house of his father at Nazareth. He must have been well known. The excellence of his character and conduct must have attracted notice. At God's appointed time, he left Nazareth, was baptized by John in the Jordan, and became his work of preaching and working wonders. The inhabitants of Nazareth likely said to one another, surely he will come to see his parents. When he comes, we'll all go hear what the carpenter's son has to say. There's always an interest in hearing one of the boys who grew up in the village when he becomes a preacher and the hope of seeing wonders like he performed in Capernaum heightened this interest. Curiosity was aroused and everybody hoped and trusted that he would make Nazareth famous among the cities of the tribes. Perhaps he would settle down and attract a crowd of customers to their shops by becoming the great physician of Nazareth. The great wonder worker of the district and after some time, the famous prophet finally visited his own city. When Sabbath drew near, interest in him grew intense. As man asked the question, what do you think? Will he be at the synagogue tomorrow? If he's there, we'll need to get him to say something. The ruler of the synagogue shared the common opinion, and at the proper point of the service, he took up the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and passed it to Jesus so he could read the passage and share his thoughts. All eyes were on him. He took the scroll and opened it, like he was very familiar with it, to a passage which applied to himself. To pay respect to the word, he stood and read it. Then he rolled up the scroll and took his seat not because he had nothing to say, but because it was a custom in those days for the preacher to sit down 
and the hearers to stand. Very interesting, right? Our preachers stand. Most of the time, I think. That is how I begin to know the preaching world. Priests, elders, missionaries stand when they do a sermon, a homily. It's quite a beautiful image to think about that because it's when the ones who are speaking up first gives the a kind of authority, a kind of a voice back to the people to stand up and ask questions. It's very well done. You see, there's always something that for us to learn from to make it a part of our life. The passage that Jesus read to them was suitable and applicable to himself, but the most remarkable point in it wasn't what he read as what he didn't read. He paused almost in the middle of a sentence. He said to proclaim the year of the Lord, of the Lord's favor, and there he stopped. The passage isn't complete unless you read the next word, and the day of vengeance of our God. Isaiah 61 verse 2. Our Lord stopped reading at those words. Maybe he wished the first sermon he delivered would be gentle, without a single threatening word. Maybe he only wanted to read the portion that he was fulfilling at that time. For he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Luke 4, 21. His heart's desire and prayer for them was that they might be saved. And instead of a day of vengeance, it might be to them the acceptable year of the Lord. He rolled up the scroll, sat down, and explained the scripture to them. He taught them who the blind were, who the captives were, who the sick and wounded and bruised were. And he taught them about the grace of God that provided liberty, healing, and salvation. They were all amazed. They had never heard anyone speak so fluently and with so much authority, so simply and yet so nobly. He had their attention. Soon a bus went around the synagogue that they said to each other, from where does this man have this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph, and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? From where then does this man have all these things? Matthew thirteen, fifty-four to 56 <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> they were astonished and envious. Then Jesus felt it wasn't the point of this ministry to astonish people. His desire was to impress their hearts. So he changed his subject, knowing their hearts. Jesus appealed to their consciences, and if man only gave a ministered their fascination, they're giving him nothing. We desire for you to become convinced and converted. Anything short of this, we fail. Jesus turned from this subject that seemed fruitful with every blessing. He saw that to them 
it was no more than pearls to swim. So he spoke to them personally, pointedly, somewhat cuttingly, or so they thought. Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard them in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Luke 4, 23. Then he told them that he didn't recognize their claims, even though he might have grown up in that district and lived with them. He was under no obligation to display his power to suit their pleasure. To emphasize his point, he said, But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But into none of them was Elijah sent, except unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a widow woman. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Luke 4, 25-27 In this way, the Savior presented the doctrine of sovereign grace. This, along with another circumstance, connected with this teaching, so provoked the anger of the entire congregation that those eyes which had looked upon him with fascination now glared at him with eyes like beasts, and their tongues, which early were ready to applaud him, howled with rage. United they rose up to slay Jesus. The curiosity of yesterday had transformed into rage today. A few hours earlier, they may have welcomed the prophet to his own country. Now there was refusal. They dragged him out of the synagogue, broke up their own worship, and with complete disregard for the day to which they paid such high regard, they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill, upon which their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went away. What an unimaginable end to such a beginning. You and I would have said, what a fruitful field we have here. The best of preachers and an audience where everyone is attentive, every ear is open, and the people are fascinated with what he has to say. We would expect countless conversations and for Nazareth to become the stronghold of Christianity, the very metropolis of the new earth. But no such thing happened. Such is the perversity of human nature. Where we expect much, we get little. The field which should have brought forth wheat hundredfold yields nothing but thorns and thistles. But maybe that's easy to say, as we have all the scriptures in our hand as Christians, as people, Christians who follow Christ. This may be an easy saying that we would think different. Let's pause on this as you study this because they the Jewish people the scribes the people who were in the synagogue for their worship they knew all about the law they knew all about what was right and they were very orthodox it means right always right and for them there appears such kind of a man who said, well, I'm more than you think that 
only the son of Mary. Even Jesus was always very humble. So, try to understand that for the Jewish people it was so so much different what they saw the scribes the priests were asked to heal people has to offer for the forgiveness of sins and all that if you study Leviticus in the Old Testament with none could accept what they saw before their eyes, the Messiah. And so much of today. So before we step in, we have it all. What are we thinking? Where are we in our relationship with Jesus? We can read everything. We have the Old and the New Testament combined in one as the Word of God, as the library the library and so much other studies they only had the Torah the five books of Moses and the Psalms and some of prophets so As the Holy Spirit helps and directs me, my plan is to apply this narrative to the hearts and conscience of those who are threatening the Savior the same way as the man of Nazareth did in the days of his flesh. Who were these rejectors of Christ? I ask the question because I'm convinced that there are certain types and representatives sprinkled throughout Christianity today. Let's take a step further. Those most closely related. These people were those who most closely related to the Savior. They were the people of his own town. Ordinarily, you might expect fellow townsmen to show a man the most kindness but he came unto his own and his own received them not it's amazing that they would reject him today some attend the church faithfully who are not Christians they were not with Christ and because of this they are against him so they are the most closely related to Christ of any unconverted people in the world. Because from their childhood they attended religious worship and joined in the songs, prayers, and services in the Lord's house. In addition to these religious practices, they are convinced of the authenticity and divine nature of the Word of God. And they have no doubt that the Savior was sent from God, that He can save, and He is the appointed Savior. They are not troubled with doubts and skeptical thoughts don't perplex them. They are in fact Agrippa, almost persuaded to be Christians. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost you persuade me to be a Christian. Acts 26, 28. They are not Christians, but they are most closely related to Christians of any people on the face of the earth. You would naturally expect that they would be the best people to proclaim the gospel to, but that has proven not to be the case. These are less likely to be brought to a decision than those who are fair, far off. Some of you might think, when you say that, you're rebuking us too. Let's move on. Those who knew the most. 
These people of Nazareth were those who knew the most about Christ. They were well acquainted with his mother and the rest of his relatives, relatives, I mean. They knew his whole pedigree. They could tell at once that Joseph and Mary were of the tribe of Judah and might have known why they came from Bethlehem and what caused them to stay in Egypt for a while. They might have known the whole story of the wondrous child. Surely this knowledgeable people didn't need to be taught the basics. They couldn't possibly need to be instructed in the very elements of the faith. They must have been a very receptive group of people for Jesus to preach to, right? That's not what happened. Many religious people are like them. You may even be like him. You know the whole story of the Savior and have known it ever since childhood. Even better, you have an intellectual grasp on the doctrines of the gospel. You can discuss gospel truths and delight in them because you take a deep interest in them. When you read the scripture, it's not a dark, mysterious book you can't comprehend. You're even able to teach others about the basic principles of the truth. Yet how strangely sad it is that you practice so little. I am afraid that some know the gospel as well, so well that it has lost much of its power. It's as well known as a story told three times. If you heard it for the first time, its freshness would strive you, but you can't experience that sense of newness and wonder at this point. One reason given for the great success of George Witchfield's preaching was that he preached the gospel to people who had never heard it before. But I believe also that as we repeat reading gospels and the word of God, that the Holy Spirit will point us to new things to see. I believe that very strongly. The gospel was a new thing to the masses of England in Whitfield's day. The gospel had been either eradicated from the Church of England and from the pulpits of those who refused to conform, or it only remained with a few within the church and was unknown to the masses outside. The simple gospel of belief and life was so unique, unique that when Whitfield stood in the fields to preach to tens of thousands, they heard the gospel as if it was a new revelation fresh from the skies. Wow. But some of you have become gospel hardened. It would be impossible to put it into a new shape for you, for your ears. The angles, the corners of truth have become old to you. Sunday follows Sunday and you attend church. You take your seats and go to the service. It has become as much of routine with you as getting up and dressing yourself in the morning. The Lord knows I dread to influence the routine on myself. I must always stay alert so it never becomes a routine for me to deal with the souls of people. I pray to God that he would deliver you and me from the deadly effect of religious routine. It would be better for some to change their place of worship than to sleep in the old one. do a step further those who suppose they had a claim on Christ here we have people who suppose they had a claim on him they didn't think it would be a great kindness on the part of the Lord Jesus to heal their sick 
they no doubt argued he's a Nazareth man and of course he's duty bound to help Nazareth in a way they consider themselves to be his owners who could command his powers at their own discretion. Our Savior rejected that idea and wouldn't wear their yoke. Sometimes I fear that some who are children of godly parents are seat holders or subscribers to various religious organizations. Imagine in your hearts that if anyone is to be saved, surely it must be you. Yet your claim has no foundation in truth. I desire that each of you would be completely and altogether saved. The mercy of God is God's sovereign gift. He has said it will a voice of thunder. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. If you kick against the sovereignty, you will stumble on a stone and be broken. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. But if you feel you have no claim upon God, if you can put yourself into the position of the publican, who, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smooth upon his breast, saying, God, reconcile me. A sinner, you are in a possession in which God can bless you with the dignity of his own sovereignty. take a step further. The gospel is for someone else. Many feel that they themselves aren't the people to whom the Savior claimed to have a commission. Observe in the 18th verse that he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Luke 4, 18. The poorest ones in the synagogue may have rejoiced at the word, but it was almost a belief among the Jewish rich that few besides the rich could enter heaven. The very proclamation of a gospel for the poor must have sounded to them democratic and extreme, and it must have led in their minds the foundation of prejudice. Jesus meant, of course, the poor in spirit, whether they are poor in pocket or not. Those who are the poor whom Jesus comes to bless, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But this concept was so contrary to all they had been accustomed to. It made them bit their lips, bite their lips. They said within themselves, we're not poor in spirit, we've kept the law. Some of them said, we've worn our selectories and made broad the borders of our garments. We haven't eaten with unwashed hands were strained out all gnats from our wine, kept the fast and the feast, and made long prayers. Why should we feel any poverty of spirit? Because of this, they thought Christ's mission had nothing for them. Next, when he mentioned the brokenhearted, they weren't aware of any need for a broken heart. They felt wholehearted, self-satisfied, and perfectly content. Who can preach to the brokenhearted 
when all these healers think that they have no reason to rip open their eyes with repentance. When he spoke of captives, they claimed to have been born free and not to have been in bondage to any man. They rejected with scorn the very idea that they needed anyone to free them because they were as free as free could be. They answered him, we are Abraham's seed and we have never served anyone. How sayest you shall be set free? Then Jesus spoke of the blind. Blind, they said, does he insult us? We are far seeing men. Let him go and preach to some of the outcasts who are truly blind. But as for us, we can see into the very depths of all mysteries. We need no instruction about opening of eyes from him. Finally, he spoke of those who had been bruised as though they had been scorched for their sins. They said, we have no sins for which we should be bruised. We have been honorable, upright people and have never been chastened with the scourge of the law. We don't want liberty for those who deserve to be bruised. What differences does the acceptable year of the Lord make to us if it's only for bruised captive ones? We aren't those people. At a glance, you understand the reason Jesus Christ is still rejected by so many church-going and chapel-going people. Here you see the reason so many of your respectable attendees at our places of worship reject salvation by grace. It's because they don't feel that they need a savior. They claim to be intelligent, thoughtful, and enlightened but they don't know that until a man sees Christ, he walks in darkness, is stone blind, and sees no light. They say they are not bruised, perhaps God has left them, because if it was of no use to bruise him. What would the point be? They only rebel more and more. They feel no pain of conscience and have no reverence for God's law. And therefore, Jesus Christ was unable to produce fruit in them. They were like a root out of a dry ground. They despised him in the ways, in same ways as the healthy man laughs at the physician and as the man who is rich doesn't care about the needs of the poor. I see another reason for the quarrel of the Nazarenes with our Lord. It was probably because they didn't love such plain personal speaking as the Savior gave them. Some people are easily offended. You must not call a spade a spade. It's an agriculture implement and shouldn't only be spoken of in grander terms. Our Lord was a plain speaking man and he spoke to man plainly. He knew that man would go to hell, so he wanted to be as plain and direct as possible. In this way, his audience wouldn't have the excuse that they couldn't understand the preacher. He put the truth so clearly that not only could they understand it, but they couldn't misunderstand it if they tried. His preaching was most personal. He didn't speak about Capernaum, but all about Nazareth. But this also made them angry.
So what came of it? This is what came of it. First, they thrust the Savior out of the synagogue. With other words, they kicked him out. And then they tried to hurl him over the edge of a steep hill. These were his friends and good, respectable people who would have believed it of them. You saw the large group of people in the synagogue who sang so sweetly and listened to attentively. Would you have guessed that there was a murder inside every one of their hearts? They worked together to throw Jesus down the hill. We don't know how much wickedness exists inside any one of us. If we aren't renewed and changed by grace, we are hairs of destruction along with all the others. The description given in Romans 2 is a truthful picture of every child of Adam. He may look respectable, but he's a deadly snake. While the snake sleeps, you may play with it, but if it wakens up, you'll see that it's a deadly thing. Sin can lie dormant in the soul, but there may come a time when it wakes up. And there may come a time in this country when those good people who hang on the skirts of Christ and attend our places of worship may actually develop into persecutors. It has already happened. And I believe that global-wide there is still persecution of the church. So what became of the Nazarenes? They rejected Christ and he left them. He left them unhealed because of their unbelief. Now it's ancient story, and in a few more years when the great triumph sound, all those men who tried to throw him over the edge of the hill will have to look at him and see him seated, where they can't grab him, abuse him, or cast him down. What a sight it will be for them. Will they say to one another, isn't this Joseph's son? When they see him sitting on the throne of his glory with his holy angels, Will they say, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brothers, James and Joseph, and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Will they then say to him, Physician, heal yourself? But what a change will come over those arrogant faces. For every sneer, there will be a blush, and for each word of anger, there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. The same thing will happen to you if you reject the Savior. Within a few more years, you and I will have mixed our bones with the earth. After that will come a general resurrection. We will live and stand in the end times of the earth, and Christ will come in the clouds of heaven. If you heard the gospel and despised him, what would you say? If have your have your apology ready because you'll be called on to say why judgment shouldn't be pronounced upon you. You can't say you didn't know the gospel, or you weren't warned about what would happen if you rejected it. You knew, but your heart wouldn't receive what you knew. When the Lord says unto those who shall be on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. What claim will you have in your defense? It will be futile to say, We have eaten and drink in thy presence, and you has thought in our thought in our streets that would only be an aggravation that the kingdom of heaven came 
so close to you and you didn't receive it. I'm not here to judge and I will not. I'm here to reach out to you and touch your heart. It's only my intention to share my love that is given by my Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to touch you, to pray with you, to comfort you, to have compassion. I'm here, maybe sometimes I speak hard words, but I don't want to use words that condemned anybody of you. My desire is that you think very, very truthful to yourself. That you treat yourself very truthful and face yourself with your Christ. And my only intention is the unconditional love that God poured out in my heart to reach out to all of you. May you find your way with God in a way that there is reconciliation. There is reconciliation with the ones that have something against you or vice versa. May this way that you hear today the word of God, may a new trumpet sound in your soul of a new way to walk with your Christ. And may God bless you. And wherever you are in the globe, may the peace of God be with you and stays with you. And may the Holy Spirit open the eyes of your heart and the eyes of your ears that you may see and hear what is right and truthful about your God. And may He renew your life and for those who are coming here and listen to these words, may your heart, your soul, find peace and healing. And may be conversion that you give your life to Christ. God bless you and hold you and has compassion over you and make you strong. So goodbye for now. This is the end of the in-depth study of the Lord's miracles and parables as we went through this very difficult portion where his own people rejected him. So let us not be judgmental. Let we be the ones who open our hearts for those who kick the stone and stumble over it. Let we be the one that reach out and help them. God bless and bye-bye.